We are so excited that you're joining us for our Living Streams online service this morning. We are called the church and we're dedicated to helping people live out the kingdom of God. We believe that through communion and intimacy with the Father, we can become more like Jesus and bring the power of his kingdom to the communities around us. If you're visiting with us this morning, we would love to have you come and be a part of our family. We do meet in person every Sunday at 10 a.m. and that's at 1049 Harbor Drive in West Columbia. If you can't make it, please visit the Connect tab on our website and we will get back in touch with you. This week is our community service week. Please contact your small group leader for the details about what your group will be doing. If you don't have a small group, contact us through the website and we would love to get you connected with one. Our Light of the World prayer service will be tonight at 6 p.m. Please come and join us here at the church building for an inspiring and world-changing time of prayer. On the last Wednesday of this month, August 31st, we will have an all women's midweek here at the building. We're not planning for the usual Kids Kingdom classes, but if you will need childcare, please contact Danielle or the church office so that we can have a good estimate for our teachers. There will be an all church leaders meeting on September 11th. So if you are a small group leader, please plan to be there after church for that meeting. We believe that generosity changes lives. If you are passionate about partnering with us in impacting our church and our community, here are two easy steps to give. You can simply text the word give to the number on the screen, or you can go to colachurch.com forward slash give. And through the website, you'll be able to set up a recurring payment if you'd like to do that. Again, we are so glad that you decided to join our Living Stream service this morning, and we hope that you are encouraged, impacted, and inspired. I hear God singing to me. Every nation must be saved. Yeah, 
deep in my soul Down deep in my soul Say do you give me joy Down deep in my soul Way down in Down deep in my soul Way down in Down deep in my soul Say do you give me joy Down deep in my soul Way down in Down deep in my soul Way down in Down deep in my soul Final breath he gave his heavenly 
We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. The Lamb is overcome. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. The Lamb is overcome. We sing hallelujah. Welcome. Thank you for tuning in to our Living Stream service this morning. Last week, we started a series called Temple of the Living God. It's a sermon series all about being the kingdom community we're supposed to be so that we can bring the kingdom to the communities around us. Last week was part one, Kingdom Within. And we talked about the fact that we, the church, is the new temple. The spirit resides in us and therefore we have to recognize the personal responsibility we have in being active members of the temple. We are not our own. We were bought by the blood of Jesus. And that should shape the way we think and the way we live. When each of us embrace this, when we realize that us being individually spiritual adds to the overall effectiveness and genuineness of the church body, then we can move on to really being the church that God calls us to be. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. Last week was about you, individually, personally, being a person of the kingdom, filled with the Spirit and transformed by His power. This week is about how the church, the temple of the living God, should function, and how when it functions, it's a force far more powerful than the gates of Hades. The title of the sermon this morning is Temple of the Living God, Part 2, True Ecclesia. Now, before we hop into the first point, I want to clarify something, and then we'll spend the rest of the time building on that. The word church that we see in the New Testament, the Greek word is ecclesia, which literally means called out. And there were many kinds of ecclesia in the world, a gathering of people called out for a specific purpose. In the Christian context, the first time Jesus uses this word is in Matthew 16, where he asked Peter and the others, who do people say I am, and who do you say I am? Peter says, you're the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God. And Jesus answers him, and he says, bingo, here's a new name, Peter. And then he makes a statement about building his church, his ecclesia, on the rock. He says the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Now, I've talked about this before, but the call doubt in this context is very specific. Jesus' church, the Church of Christ, was a gathering founded on the rock of Jesus' word and forged by the power of the Holy Spirit into a living temple that would bring living water to all the earth. That's what we are. That's what the church is. It's not a building. It's not programs, it's not a place, and it doesn't happen at a specific time. Sabbath is a rest day. 
Sunday is the first day of the week when we take communion together. But church, church is us. We are a gathering founded on the rock of Jesus' word and are every day being forged by the power of the Spirit into the temple of the living God. And our mission is to bring living water to the world around us. And God has designed his church to work in a specific way so that it can achieve the purpose for which it was built. So, this morning, let's get into how this church should actually function. My first point, body of power. Read with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12. Just as a body, though one has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Now if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And God has placed in the church, first of all, apostles, second, prophets, third, teachers, then miracle workers, then gifts of healing, of helping, of guidance, and of different kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all do miracles of work? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? Now eagerly desire the greater gifts. And now I will show you the most excellent way. We have all heard this analogy a thousand times, but it still stands. Paul likens the church to a body. The body has different parts, but they all work towards the same goal of life and health. This whole scripture, he concludes with talking about gifts of the Spirit, which is what this whole section of the book is focusing on. People were bickering about what gifts of power were better or which ones they wish they had, and they were literally treating people differently based on their spiritual gifts. Now, this is the truth. If you have the Holy Spirit, you are filled with the power of God. And that power is first and foremost so that you can repent and be made new in the image of Christ. And the second purpose of that power is to equip you to be an effective member of the body. The church in Corinth were fighting over the gifts. They were abundant and being used all over the place to the point where their worship services were full and vibrant, but chaotic and a bit nonsensical. There was so much going on, so many people eager to use their gifts and display their power that it became a holy mess. Paul writes several chapters, actually, addressing this, saying that there needs to be both power and order present so that the non-believer will be blown away and know that God is present. That means that the power of God 
should be present within the body of Christ. The power should be obvious. It should be disciplined, and it should be effective at accomplishing the purposes of God. I wish, I wish that we had the same issue that the Corinthian church had. Their individual members were not only filled with power and gifts, but they were eager to use them. They were all clamoring to serve and use their gifts that God gave them. Their issue was pride and a lack of discipline. I feel like we have the opposite problem. We have plenty of disciples in this church, and we have some who diligently and consistently use their gifts so the body can display God's power and presence. But I think we have a lot of people whose individual lives hold no power, and therefore they add no power to the body. More than that, even if the power comes from being together, it's in the community that the power is found, we have a hard time even meeting together. This body fails to be powerful because of two things. One, we are not personally powerful in the spirit. And two, many of us have given up the habit of meeting together. To the first, there could be many reasons for this. Some of us may be in unrepentant sin. Some of us may not believe we have any power because our gift isn't preaching or teaching. Sin will undermine whatever power you're trying to display. And I'm here to remind us that even if we don't know our gifts, even if it's not blatantly obvious, the church still needs you. We need you here on a Sunday morning. We need you at our Light of the World prayer night. We need you at small group. We need you to come over for dinner. We need you to inspire our kids. We need you to inspire and guide our youth. We need you to warn the timid. We need you to help the weak. We need you to be patient with everyone. We need you to pray for everyone. We may not know what your power is, but if we're all together consistently, if we function like a body is supposed to, unified and in step with each other, then the body will be powerful as God intended it to be. He will enlighten each of us on where our gifts are, but everything starts with being devoted to the fellowship. A true church, at the very least, is one that is committed to being together, meeting together. At the very least, if we're together, we can see the power of God. But if we're not together, we'll never tap into what the Spirit is capable of. My second point, structure of service. Read with me in Matthew 20, verse 20. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with her sons, and kneeling down, asked a favor of him. What is it you want? He asked. She said, grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right and the other at your left in your kingdom. You don't know what you are asking, Jesus said to them. Can you drink the cup I am going to drink? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will indeed drink from my cup, but to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared by my father. When the 10 heard about this, they were indignant with the two brothers. Jesus called them together and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. This scripture both scares me and inspires me. First, let me say that Jesus did not rebuke these men for having ambition. It's not a bad thing to want to be great in the kingdom of heaven. My prayer is that all of us would have the desire to have great expectations for ourselves and great expectations for where God is taking us together. But the path 
to that greatness is service. It's selflessness. It's humility. It's a sacrificial willingness to suffer for the sake of the kingdom. Jesus says, can you drink the cup? A lot of us said yes at the waters of baptism, but over the years, once we started to realize how hard it is, once we realized how ungrateful disciples can be, we've grown tired, we've grown bitter, we've grown weary of doing what is good. Once we realize that being great means becoming a slave, once we realize that growing more like Jesus means serving and suffering like he did, many of us stop desiring greatness. Many of us crave mediocrity because greatness is too difficult. We desire not to triumphantly enter heaven on the last day, but to enter as one who just barely escaped the flames. And therein lies the problem. Many of us have no passion for God and his kingdom. A true church doesn't just have some people who serve within it. The entire structure of the body is centered around service. The king himself said, I did not come to be served, but to serve. If we are disciples of that king, then that mindset, that heart, has to be our mindset and our heart. You are not here to be served, but to serve. But how should we be serving? Here are a few ways. One, serve your neighbors. Cut their grass. Take their trash to the curb. Babysit their kids. Be their friends. Number two, serve your small groups. Be present. Be wing men and women. Bring a song, a scripture, a thought or question. Bring food and drink. Bring dessert. Be vulnerable and real. Be humble. Ask for needs. Number three, serve the body. Find a team to be on, whether it's ushers or AV or Kids Kingdom or worship or security or firm foundations assistance or be on the board. In these roles, be consistent. Be a learner. Be a joy and not a burden. Do everything without grumbling and complaining. How are you serving currently? What are the ways that you need to serve? Have we settled for mediocrity? My call to all of us is to strive to be great. It will hurt, but it will be more fulfilling than anything else on earth. My final point this morning, way of love. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1. And now I will show you the most excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of men or angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no records of wrongs, love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully even as I am fully known. Now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. The greatest of these is love. Neither of the above two points works if love is not present. 
I mentioned that sometimes we can crave mediocrity because we don't have passion. And I said that some of us have no passion for God and his kingdom. And that's where the breakdown is. Many of us may just be here because of what God provides rather than being here because you are passionate about loving God. Everything starts or should start with passionately loving God. And some of you may say, well, I'm just not that emotional of a person. I don't feel things deeply. And here's the deal, me too. And the cool thing about this defining scripture of love is that it never mentions a feeling. Love gives us verb after verb. Love behaves patiently. Love behaves kindly. Love keeps no records of wrong. Love rejoices with the truth. It hopes, it protects, it perseveres. It doesn't fail, meaning it's consistent. It does what it does despite feelings. Loving God passionately starts with you being consistent. And he is so good. God is so worthy. He's so awesome that the passion and the feelings will follow, but it's more than just loving God. The true church is defined and held together by its love. Jesus taught, by your love for each other, people will know you are my people. Paul said, love binds us all together in perfect unity. Think about your relationships. Think about your small groups. Think about the whole body. Do you actually love the body? Are you consistent in the virtues mentioned before? Consistent with your relationships and your small groups? Consistent with loving the body? Are you unified? Are you willing to fight for this bond and this body? The new temple is no longer a building of brick and mortar. It's a building of humans held together by love and filled with the Spirit. The true church follows the most excellent way. And this is what we're called to. We were called to be a body of power. We were called to have a structure of service. And we were called to follow the way of love. Jesus allowed his body to be broken and his blood to be shed so that we could become the temple of the living God. So church, let's be that temple and shine in all the power and all the love of Christ himself. Let's pray now for the bread and the cup. Father God, you are good. You are awesome. Thank you for this gift of the church, God. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to be the true ecclesia, and I pray that we live up to the call, God. I pray that we recognize the power that's in this body, God, that we can be people of service, God, and that we can follow the way of love. Let us be spurred on by the thought of your son and the cross today, God. I pray now for the bread and the cup as we remember the sacrifice Jesus made so that we ourselves can not only be sanctified by that sacrifice, but so that we can follow in his steps. We love you. We thank you for this time. In your son Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you for worshiping with us this morning. If you're impacted at all by the message, here are some next steps you can take this week to help you live out what you heard preached this morning. Make a decision today to build a deep conviction about being a consistent and present member of the body. Find some way to consistently serve in the church. Figure out where your love falls short and make an effort to grow in that area. If you stay tuned, at the end of this stream, we will have discussion questions that will help you dive deeper into the sermon content. You can write them down or find them at colachurch.com forward slash living streams. Thanks again for joining us this morning.